Okay, I think that's it. Hello everyone, this is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel, and uh, welcome to the I Love Jeet Kune Do broadcast number 31. This is the one about the wisdom of uh, Dan and Sano. Oh, and by the way, I've got, um, for me, I, I got a, a blockbuster piece of Jeet Kune Do information that, um, that I've not heard uh, very many people uh, talk about. So uh, hang tough and, and we'll get to that uh, in today's show. Um, last week we did uh, the wisdom of Bruce Lee, so I thought it was only um, fitting and appropriate to do something on the wisdom of Dan and Asano. My, um, my Jeet Kune Do senior, uh, Cass Magda, pointed out to me that it's time that I get a picture of uh, Sifu Dan up on the backdrop behind me, so I'm working on that. Um, I'll, I'll be out of town o over the next few days. I leave t uh, tomorrow to do a seminar down in Barbados. So um, hopefully by this time next week, I'll have a picture of Seafood in Asano in the back behind me. Um, this, this one, th talking about the wisdom of Dan and Asano, this will be a tricky one for the simple reason that, um, that uh, Seafood Dan, whether, whether he or anyone likes it or not, is a, a, a polarizing individual simply because of the position that he occupies in the martial art world at large and the Jeet Kune Do world in particular, right? So anyone who knows me will knows well that um, I, I would not be the person that I am today and I would not be in the position that I'm in today were it not for, for Dan and Asano's influence. And it's not just me, right, of course. Uh, last week I told you about the uh, two weekends ago, I was in Jacksonville at, at an Inosano seminar, and I was there with people like Dickie Harrell and Levon Martin and Diana Rathborn and um, Neil and Helena Colliff and uh, Victor Ferreros and Lee Peacock and Kenny Barry and Juan Perez and what have you. So, um, so it's not just me who has fallen under Dan Inosano's influence for, for many years, right? So if in the course of today's broadcast, you hear me say anything that sounds somewhat disparaging, know that just like I believe that just about everything that, that Dan and Asano has ever done in the Jeet Kune Do world um, has been well-intentioned, so are my comments today, right? In fact, let me just say this and, and get it out of the way. I think that Dan and Asano's biggest fault, right, so to speak, is that he never... Um, confronted the, the controversies of, of Jeet Kune Do right when they came up, right? He didn't, um, he didn't nip in the bud any, uh, let's call them, um, dissension in the ranks, for lack of a, 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 a different expression, right? So if, if, if there is a critique that I would, that I would make of his, um, of, of his uh, approach is that he didn't confront certain things as readily as I think he, he should have, but it's not my decision, right? So originally, I was going to title today's broadcast um, the JKD Kali Connection, and uh, but then I rethought that and decided that, like last week, we talked about the wisdom of Bruce Lee, so we'll talk about um, Dan and Asano's wise contributions to the art of Jeet Kune Do. So right off the bat, we got to get into the discussion of um, of Kali, right? Um, Right now, at the recommendation of, of Cass Magda, again, I'm reading um, this book called uh, uh, Cebuano Escrima, I think, right? I point this out because a lot of the stories that, that, that I heard about Kali in the early days are being disputed in, in this very book. Now, I'm, I'm not that concerned with who's right and who's wrong because ultimately, I think what matters is what we've done with the knowledge that's been given to us, right? So for example, one of the disputes is whether the term Kali is truly derived from the words Kamut, which means hand, Katawan, which means the body, and Lihok, which means motion. Now that's something that I was told, and that is something that I have, uh, in turn, have taught to, to, to my students over the years, right? The authors of Cebuano Escrima contend that there is no such thing. So I do know, even though I only started reading the book literally yesterday, I do know that they don't specifically object to the use of the word Kali for, as they say, branded purposes. But they do, they're, they're kind of sticklers for, for accuracy. And so um, their contention is that this uh, Kamai Lihok, Katawan Lihok thing is, is not uh, historically accurate. 
But as I say, what matters is what, what, we do, what, what we do with the information or the knowledge that has been passed on to us. So for me, that whole um, hand and body motion led to the description of the art of Kali as being the art of understanding um, hand and body motion with or without a weapon, which for me was an easy way, let's say, to, um, uh, uh, to encapsulate a description of an art that defies easy description, right? If, if you get what I mean. Um, my first inkling of th some kind of Filipino art being included in uh, Jeet Kune Do came, I've shown you guys this before, right? Uh, Fighting Arts of March 1976, right? So it's uh, page 41 for those of you who might have it. And, and here's, here's, what it, here's what it shows, right? Um, Filipino stick fighting technique, and you'll see that it says they're part of JKD curriculum, right? So the funny thing is that I saw this, and I didn't really pay attention to the fact that in this same magazine, on page 14, there is this, right? Rhythm and Death Matches, the Filipino Art of Kali, Right with uh, 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 Grand Tujon uh, Ben Largusa. Right, so in 1976, right. Let me show you these photos. Right, this kind of stuff didn't make any sense to me whatsoever in 1976. But by July 31st of 1983, it made more sense because I had just spent my first week training with Dan and Asano. Right. Um, if you want to see this, um, this article for yourself, go to uh, my JKD Seniors uh, website, Chris Kent. It's uh, CK, what is it? CKJKD.com. And uh, just click on the, there's a button on the horizontal bar called More, and then it's PDF articles. And you'll see um, this magazine cover, and he has scanned um, that article for, for the whole world, right? Actually, in a post on that, on that same uh, website, um, Chris writes something about, uh, let's get, let me, let me pull up the quote right here. It says, JKD is not about creating a melting pot or a mosaic of different styles, but doing away with the idea of styles entirely. Another principle that was continually reaffirmed to me by my teacher, Dan Anasano, was, if you understand motion, you don't need style." Right? If you understand motion, you don't need style. So there is that operative word, motion, that f for me, for Dwight Woods, takes me back to the whole idea of hand and body motion. So that's why for me, Kali plays an integral part. So my student, um, uh, Miguel Colasanti, is, is on watching, right? He and I have had, we've been having these discussions about Jun Fan plus Kali equals JKD and stuff like that for, I don't know, five, six, seven years or, or what have you, right? So that whole thing though, if you understand motion, you don't need style. Do you see how that is related to the truth in martial art, right? So I show you guys um, this book every week, Sin Falta. Right, the art and philosophy book, and in here, uh, page 167, and I never get a good shot of it, but you all know what I'm talking about. The truth in martial art is different for every individual in this style, right? And then it has what I call the four tenets of Jeet Kune Do, right? Research your own experience for the truth, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. Okay, here's the deal. And I got this, Cass is the one who, who sent me on the, the research trip because I keep saying that that sign hung in Bruce Lee's Chinatown school. That is incorrect, right? And so every time that I've said that, I'm issuing the correction for it. It never hung in the Chinatown school. It hung at the Kali Academy. But here's the blockbuster piece of information. That, um, let, me, let me read it to you. We should carefully study the lessons which were learned in past wars at the cost of blood and which have been bequeathed to us. We must absorb conclusions thus reached 
to the test of our own experiences and absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is specifically our own. Here's the deal. Hands up if you know where that comes from. Yeah, right. Okay. Go on the YouTube and find a video that's entitled um, Dan and Asano about Bruce Lee and JKD. It's published by um, Maya, the Martial Arts Industry Association. And at about 6 minutes and 30 seconds in on the video, he mentions something about Sun Tzu's um, Art of War. Right? Um, now, it, he's on the right track, but it's a, it, it, what he says is a little bit misleading because it's not actually in Sun Tzu's Art of War. But what it is, is that there's an edition of the Art of War by a guy named Samuel Griffith, right? And on um, page 55 of the introduction of the Samuel Griffith edition of, of um, the Art of War, there's a section on Sun Tzu's influence on Mao Zedong, right? And so that's where I, I'll, I'll, I'll try. If somebody messages me or emails me or whatever, I'll, I, can, I can send you this, this uh, thing. But that saying actually comes from Mao Zedong's book, page 166, um, uh, it's called On the Protracted War, right? So the credit for what I have ultimately called the four tenets of Jeet Kune Do should actually go to Dan and Asano. So all over the internet where you read these Bruce Lee quotes about absorb what is useful and people like to adapt or, and then people like to say discard what is not, they get it wrong, right? The, the, the thing that they're getting wrong is that it's not actually... A Bruce Lee quote. This stuff is is actually can be um, attributed to Dan and Asano because he, I, 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 if I got the story correctly, right? If I understood what Cass was telling me, Asano read it and he said, "Hey, that's just like Jeet Kune Do," and that's how that sign came in came into being. But it's from uh, Mao Zedong's um, book on the protracted war, page uh, one sixty six. Right? Okay, so. Um, Back to when I was introduced to the idea of Jeet Kune Do, right? So here was the idea. Um, Jeet Kune Do is about training the techniques to develop the attributes. So I was blown away by that concept because that was not something that I had been introduced to in martial art um, pre previously, right? I remember that in the promo materials for the old Inosano Academy, there was a statement about Kali being a method for turbocharging your empty hands, right? Which is something that you can appreciate when you discover, for example, the pattern of, of double stick, right? So like a lot of us here know heaven six, right? Where the, the hands weave like this in, in the double stick pattern. Well, that heaven six drill, that weaving pattern, right? It's the sticks that, it's the hands that propel the sticks. So the sticks get fast, your hands get fast. And so that can translate into the attribute of hand speed for your boxing combinations, for your, your Wing Chun um, uh, battle punches or the straight blast like we call it in JKD or the, the Jik Chun Choi or, or what have you, right? Then the other thing uh, about that is that as far as I know, right, and let me make that disclaimer, in the early days of Jeet Kune Do, there wasn't necessarily a, a highly developed um, weapons training uh, approach, right? So for example, um, in, let's see, uh, page 412 of, the, of this book. All right, you guys can see this. This is the, the, this is the first edition of the Bruce Lee's Fighting Method. All right, so um, 412, it shows here, all right, defense against a knife thrust, all right? And I'm probably doing a terrible job of holding it up here too. But if you see that, you'll see that uh, one of Bruce Lee's responses to the knife thrust is to kick, the, um, to kick the knife out of the guy's hand. Well, yeah, that works if the guy holds it in, uh, well, <laughs> I'm not even sure that it works, right? Maybe back then, because these pictures were taken, what, 1966 or something. So maybe back then it might be surprising to kick a knife out of somebody's hand. I don't know that that would work today. But my point about it is this. It'll work if he holds it in heaven grip. But if a guy holds his knife, like we do in Filipino Kali a lot of times, in earth grip, there is no way that you're going to be kicking this out of, out of his hand, right? So, so Kali's emphasis on, on weapons training, right, will also, um, 
contribute to the, 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 the weapons portion, right, of, of your JKD d development, right? Um, then there's the attribute, let's, let's call it, the attribute of sensitivity or, or stickiness, right? Let's say in, um, in the trap in hands, right? Um, again, in the Art and Philosophy book, right, page 153, Sifu Dan talks about what is, let's see, let me read it here. Um, uh, let's see. In Jeet Kune Do, the front hand takes precedence over the rear hand. Uh, no, that's not the part I wanted. Right. In Eskrima, it's the same thing. In JKD, we use the term uh, trapping. In Eskrima, they say checking. Right. Now, also, that is um, reinforced in the Fight and Arts article. Right. So, in the Fight and Arts on page 23, is it 23? Yeah. Right. This motion here is what they call the safety factor, right? So that's why sometimes we're taught in, um, in, in Filipino Kali, right? There's the initial block, the safety factor, and the killing blow, right? Or sometimes the terminology is um, block, check, hit, right? That, that kind of thing. So um, for, for, I'm, I'm, trying to, to, I'm trying to do this in a rush also because I got to train a private client right when I'm done. So forgive me if I'm talking a little bit faster than I usually do. Um, for me personally, one of the most impactful aspects of, of the Kali is what I call, I, I call it the mind expansion uh, training, right? Um, so Kali teaches that for every inward motion, there's a backhand motion, for example, right? For every slash, there's a thrust, right? So the... the I'll, you know what? Let me come back to that in, in a second, right? So, okay, so we talked about weapons and we talked about Kali. On, um, thank God, Dan and Asano didn't stop there in his wisdom in influencing us, right? So, let's see, page 78 of old school, page 78, old school Dawa Jeet Kune Do, all right? Uh, everybody's seen this before. I think I've shown it on, on the program before. Here's a, a, a little depiction of Bruce Lee's notes on um, Savat and, and Muay Thai, right? So we know that Bruce Lee had uh, some, some kind of interest in that. On page 46 of the Tao, right, in the section on uh, endurance, right, Bruce Lee says, the best form of endurance exercise is the performance of the event, Right? Um, of course, running and shadow boxing are necessary supplementary endurance exercises, but you should do them with broken rhythm, broken neurophysiological adjustment, right? So the best form of endurance exercise is the performance of the event. Well, I told you guys about um, uh, Dick, Dickie Harrell, right? So because of Sifu Dan's relationship with Ajahn Chai in the, in the Muay Thai, um, Dickie Harrell, who, who I mentioned, is from North Carolina, and he was at the Jacksonville seminar. Dickie Harrell's introduce, in, introduction to endurance, Muay Thai style, was the performance of the event, a.k.a. double kick the tie pads, right, for three minutes. So you do a three-minute round, you double kick the tie pad. It, 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 so the performance of the event is the endurance exercise for it, right? You get a good kick, you get the power, you get the speed, you get the conditioning, right? So Dickie's... Um, uh, introduction was in 1982. Mine was in 1984. Right, and and this is this is an example of Inosano's wisdom because he's way 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 ahead of the curve. UFC one, which had not yet morphed into what it is today, which is really you know uh, Muay Thai for stand up and 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 um and and BJJ for for the ground to a certain degree. Right, um, we're talking. Early 1980s, UFC 1 came almost 15 years later in 1993, and then maybe it took, well, I don't know, maybe another five years for that blend, that MMA blend of, of jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai, right, to, to come on the mat. But here's Dan Inosano introducing his JKD students way, way back in the 80s, right, to, to what um, Muay Thai is able to do for you, right? Um, on page, uh, what is it now? Okay, 169 of the Tao, right? Uh, let me get to it. Because, you know, I have to verify that, you, that, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm talking the right stuff. Nothing bothers an adversary more than variety in both attack and defense, right? Nothing bothers an adversary 
more than variety in both attack and defense. So let me show you something. This is a training manual for the official Box Frances Savat technical uh, pro pro program, right? Progression. So in here, you've got the stuff for silver glove. You got the stuff for yellow glove. You got the stuff for white glove, which was the rank that I got back in 1987 or 88. Um, red glove, green glove, blue glove, or what have you. And this stuff, let me tell you, th th you want variety, right, in your offense and defense. Box Ron says Savat is definitely something that you should check out. As a matter of fact, Right, I'll give you. I'll give you a a, a, a hint. Um, again, go to the YouTube and look up. Uh, look for a video title, uh, Salem Ashley Savat Six. Uh, wait, yeah, Salem Ashley Savat Six Intro, and it will show you. You'll see Salem do five kicks. How many? Five. Five kicks with one leg, the same leg, without putting that leg down. So if you want variety, right, then that's something that you should take a look at. But in all, in all seriousness, right, that's fancy kicking. It might not be the most practical thing for street defense or what have you. But like Salem says, um, he who can do more can do less. So if you can do five kicks with one leg, different angles, different kicks, different uh, trajectory, imagine how, how easy it is for you to just do one or two kicks on the low line, right? Um, so that's, that's Box Frances' emphasis on precision and accuracy and, and angulation. So then you can take that Savat flavor, you can take that uh, Muay Thai flavor, you can add those to your Jun Fan flavor, and you know what you can get? Because I, this is an experiment that I conducted, so I have empirical uh, knowledge and experience of this. And actually, my client, um, um, Lisa Lee, who is watching, she can verify this, right? Our fitness kickboxing program, back when I had my school, right, at Unified Martial Art, our fitness kickboxing program was probably one of the most successful programs, right, in town, bar none. And I think it was because we had that unique blend of three kickboxing methods being taught, right? I, I remember when Ricky Amador and, and Suri Nieves and I went for... Um, certification with NATMA in the early days of what they call cardio kickboxing, we were like the only people in that class, in that group, who could move to the rhythm. Because in JKD, what have we been doing? We've been, we've been moving to music, right, for decades. But the other people were karate people who were trying to transform their style, right? <laughs> okay, so they were having kind of a, a rough time with it, right? Anyhow, okay, so... Um, So, okay, so, so far, we've looked at Inosano's wisdom in helping us to develop weapons and striking, but he didn't leave us hanging when it came to the grappling. So, in his wisdom, um, Dan Inosano introduced us to grappling methods as far back as 1983. In my first week with him, that's where I'm, I was um, introduced to um, Indonesian and Dutch-Indonesian Pendrak Silat. Right, I met uh, um, John De Jong and um, Steven Plink in 1983. Right, so after that there was um, Suryadi Jaffrey, right, Eddie Jaffrey. There was uh, Herman Suwanda, and there, there was Paul De Torres. Right, unfortunately for us, you know, the, the, some of these guys are, are, are now deceased, but they have they have trained a lot of people um, they, because because of Dan and Sano's influence. Um, a lot of us were exposed to this Panjak Silat training, and so uh, even though those leaders are gone, the, their tradition uh, continues, right? I remember being in Wisconsin with Sifu Dan. This was the summer of um, 1988, I think it was, and he was demonstrating how the entries in Silat were much more um, penetrative than, let's say, entries in, in Wing Chun, when, when, it when it comes to, like, hand trapping or, 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 or checking or what have you, right? So it was kind of like, a, a, if I remember correctly, the term that was being used was a crash system. Or if I'm correct, it's what, uh, again, my, my, my senior, Cass Magda, would call um, being in your opponent's house, 
right? And so what Sifu Dan was saying is that the, the penetrative aspect of, of the, the Pendrak Silat um, uh, hand trapping, for, what, what, what I got from that was that if I added that attitude, let's call it, to the Jun Fan trapping or the Wing Chun trapping, then you would get a more effective trapping method. So ever since then, that's what I've tried to do, right? So it changes your, your focus, right? And then something from Silat that has worked for me. It's, for, for me, it's great for effective takedowns that do not require your going to the floor also, right? So, so in other words, it's an effective takedown, do your damage and get the heck out of there, right? So it, it's, what, it's what I call the differentiation between standing grappling and, and, and ground fighting, right? Um, so that was 1988. 1989, we were in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and, uh, and Sifu Dan introduced us in limited fashion to, um, to Burmese boxing, right? Bondo. And um, in, in more recent years, he's added to his um, repertoire, let's call it, right? Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, and more recently, Sistema to a certain degree, I think. And uh, I know he's, he's training in. Um, uh, Khmer boxing, uh, Pradal Sere, I, I don't have the, the right pronunciation for it, right? But this is a kickboxing method from, from Cambodia, right? So I'll end with, with this, right? So let me go back to the Tao. So the Tao on page 16, right? So way, way up in the beginning. Let me see. I hope I got it. Nope. Ah, there we go, right? So here is it, page 16. Here's where it says. Ah, thanks, Ray. I forgot. There we go, right? Um, don't tell anybody. It's a secret between me and you, Mr. Wells. But I have, um, in the next two weeks, I got maybe maybe seven new shirts coming in, right? So, okay. So, um, knowledge is fixed in time, whereas knowing is continual. Knowledge is fixed in time, whereas knowing is continual. I think, right, that that might be why Dan and Asano keeps on studying with different people, because he wants to constantly be in the know, right? Now, you get that joke? Let's see if you guys are smart, right? He constantly wants to be in the know or in the now, and I think that's why that company, right, Know Now Publishing, I think that's why all his books came from a company with that name. But we'll have to ask uh, Sean Foon. I don't think Sean is on watching. We'll have to ask Sean Foon and maybe David Chang when I finally get them on the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues uh, show, right? We'll ask Sean about his, the, the, the name source of his dad's company, right? But that's what I think. I think Inosano constantly wants to be in the know, right? And that's why it, it's continual learning for him as opposed to um, stop, stopping your learning, stop being a student, and now you're just a teacher, right? So now you're, you're dispelling all this knowledge, right? That is fixed. And, you know, it, it, there's that other Jeet Kune Do quote about um, in, in memory of the, the, the once fluid man, right? So there's an idea. Kenny Barry uh, expressed it the other day about Jeet Kune Do being about... Um, what, what, oh, let me... Do, don't mess it up. He said about Jeet Kune Do being about the flow, right? About staying fluid and being balanced, right? So... Through his tireless example, right? I, I wish I, I wish I had the picture that I could show you. I took, um, you know, I told I told you guys I got to hang out with Seafood Dan for like two hours at, at the Jacksonville Airport, and I took a picture of his um, his uh, American Airlines um, Advantage uh, bag tag, right? So it's got Dan and Asano, and then on the bottom it says eight million miles, right? <laughs> so eight million miles. So I think that's what we could call a tireless example, right, of staying on the path of Jeet Kune Do as an expression, as the, the ultimate in, in self-expression, right? I, I, I think that he's shown us how, how to stay true to yourself. And in doing so, he provides a role model for those of us who might want to go down um, a, a similar path, right? Now, his is not a perfect path example, but he, he wrote about that too, right? So this is the last one I'll, I'll, I'll show you guys, 
All right, um, page 175 of the Filipino martial arts book. All right, so it's right here. I got to be careful with this one. This is my original copy. It's right here at the end, right? And it says, to all seekers of the way, knowledge comes from your instructor. Wisdom comes from within. All right, so thanks very much for tuning in, guys. That's it for today. As always, um, I apologize. I, I, I can't... Um, respond to you while 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 i'm talking um but feel free to like and comment i will go through the comments after the video is posted and answer anything that, that's asked or or just re-comment myself um also check out the i love jeet kundo quick skill series volume one available for immediate download at uh, i love jeet kundo .com. Um, like I said, I'll be down in Barbados teaching a, a seminar for my students uh, down there this weekend. So there will be no Jeet Kune Do dialogue show on Friday. But next Friday on June 22nd, um, check in at 3 p.m. We'll be dialoguing with Ron and Jesse James Kosakowski. Right? I got to practice between now and then to not mess their names up. Right? So Ron and Jesse James Kosakowski. Uh, Kosakowski, right? And they are um, Practical Self-Defense Training Center in, um, in Connecticut. All right, so that's it. Um, I'll see you again next week, same time, same JKD channel. As always, this is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel, signing off. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.